If you don't know, I'm a big variety gamer. I know this YouTube channel may focus a little more on roguelites, but as a whole, I play a lot of games and try to finish every single one I play. What I want to do is rank every single game I've played in 2023, regardless of when it was released. I'm going to do my best to go in order of games I have beat throughout the year. And of course, just remember, this is my list and my opinion on all these games. I thought this would just be a fun little thing to do, a little end of the year in the 2024 video. So let's get into it. To start this list off, we have the first game I beat this year but started it in late 2022 and it's God of War Ragnarok. It initially released November 9th of 2022 and I started it a little later than some people but I found the story to be good. Minus the Atreus missions, which I felt dragged on at some points. I did like the game, but it felt very similar to the 2018 God of War in terms of combat. And it got a little tedious for me because I played the original God of War just a few months prior. But with that said, it was a solid game. I played the game for about 50 hours and would rank it in low A tier to start this list off. Next is a game that I ranked in my previous roguelite tier list video, so it will be kind of easy to re-rank it in its inscription. It released October 19th, 2021, and it's a fantastic deck builder with some fora and puzzle aspects. It's one of the greatest stories I've ever seen in gaming and really enjoyed how the game was paced. It started a bit slow for me, but ended up being fantastic. And with that said, it still belongs at S tier for me. And next is another roguelike that was ranked before, but I played it in January, so we gotta re-rank it and it's Wizard of Legend. It was released May 15th of 2018, and my favorite thing with this game was the in-depth variety with magic items and the endless amount of builds the game offered. I felt the combat was fun, but a little unfair with the lack of iframes, and I felt they made the game a little bit harder to make up for the lack of content the game had. As the run only took about 20 minutes and after winning a single run you kind of saw everything the game had to offer. It had a little boss rush mode but it's a C tier game for me still but pretty high in C tier and I'm hoping Wizard of Legend 2 is fantastic. Okay let's take a small roguelike break quickly and talk about a game that I finally played at the beginning of the year and everybody loves this classic game and it's Fallout New Vegas. It was released October 19th 2010 and I'll be honest this was the first Fallout game I fully played and it was a good experience. I love the general story of Fallout trying to survive in an apocalyptic wasteland and this story in Vegas was fun and engaging but I definitely didn't do as much side quests nor the DLC like I should have. I beat the game in about 30 hours and it had a lot of bugs on the PC and I didn't have any mods installed so that's the vanilla experience but overall it was still good. I put in an A tier above God of War Ragnarok and let me tell you this isn't the last time we'll be seeing Fallout this year. Alright now we're back to roguelites and this was the last game I played in January and it was Skull the Hero Slayer. It was released January 20th 2021 and I ranked it in C tier in my roguelite tier list video but looking back I feel I may have been a little too harsh on this game. I want to go back and play it some more as the combat does feel good and fluid, the music fits the game well, and the amount of variety is fantastic. My biggest gripe was how hard it was, but I think I just sort of stunk and didn't do enough research on trying to get better builds. I have a tendency to be impatient of these types of games, and I really need to go back and give it more patience. I think this game belongs right in B tier, the first B tier of the year. And after that, we're on our way to February, and let me tell you, just like every month, I was playing a lot of games, and in February, the first game I played was the Dead Space Remake. It was released January. 27th of 2023 so I was a little bit late but this was my first time playing Dead Space and it was incredible. I wouldn't say it was scary and more so anxiety inducing in a good way if that's even possible. Every step I took had me wondering where the enemies were and the story kept me on my toes. It's a series I 100% want to play more of and would easily put Dead Space in A tier above God of War and New Vegas. Really this game was awesome. Minus that one area of aerodynamics and floating around with that giant puzzle that area stunk but everything else was great. And right after Dead Space, I played a game from my favorite series ever for the first time, and it was Metroid Prime Remastered. Nintendo Shadow dropped this game after a Nintendo Direct on February 8th of 2023, and I played through this game so fast and loved it, as I do with every Metroid game. The crazy amount of hidden secrets with more ammo, the great pacing with upgrades, the fantastic bosses. I love Metroid, and this is an S-tier game for me, and one of the best games I've played this year. Now, I'm not done with Nintendo yet. The next game I played released in January, but I wasn't able to beat it until February, and it was my first first entry in the series and it was Fire Emblem Engage. It released January 20th of 2023 and it was a pretty good time overall. I didn't have an interest in Fire Emblem Three Houses which isn't like a traditional Fire Emblem game with a tactical turn based combat which was more the focus in Engage. The story and combat was good in Engage and it had side quests that I didn't really want to do but it was a nice addition for more bang for your buck. 
and even as DLC. The voice acting was eh, but the gameplay was fantastic, and I'm putting in B tier ahead of Skull the Hero Slayer. It would be an A tier if I enjoyed the voice acting more. I think the story was good, it was just the cutscenes and all that, it was very Nintendo, but still, the combat was great. After that, we went over to one of my Twitch chat's favorite games, and it's Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. I am playing the trilogy, but only beat the first one in February, and didn't know what to expect with the game. It was first released in Japan in 2001, and then America in 2005, but it's a visual novel game where you play as a novice lawyer solving some big time crimes. I was a fan of all the investigating and the trials, but it was just so tiring reading everything as I was streaming it. I 100% want to play the other games, as this is the first time I played a visual novel game, and it was fantastic. The characters were all very lovable, the music's some of my favorite if I listen to the soundtrack by myself, and really, I'd put this game in A tier right behind God of War Ragnarok. And now we have a game that I consider one of the greatest of all time, and I did replay it this year, mostly off stream, but did beat it, so here we are, and it's Portal 2. It released April 11th of 2011, and what can't I say about this game? Amazing puzzles, incredible storytelling as always, and a great multiplayer experience that holds up in 2023. If you haven't played it, play it. And if you want to play it with a friend, play it with a friend. This is an S tier game, and it's at the top of S tier as of right now. Portal 2 is amazing. Next, we have another roguelike game that was ranked previously, and it's Returnal. It initially released April 30th, 2021 on PS5, but got released on the PC on February 15th of 2023, which made me replay it and do everything. I got all the achievements, every collectible, and even played the Tower of Sisyphus quite a bit. I love this game. It's fast-paced movement with decent weapon variety on top of a good story that does keep you engaged. And like I said, the Tower of Sisyphus, that's free DLC that adds so much replayability to the game after you beat it initially. This game is still easily an A-tier game for me, but between Dead Space and Fallout New Vegas. It being on PC was a very nice bonus, as I did not like playing it with a controller compared to mouse and keyboard. And that was February. On the March, it was another busy month, but in March, I decided to do a 2D Mario marathon where I replayed all the 2D Mario games, so let's get ready for all those. We first played the original Super Mario Bros, and it was released in 1985. No date for NA, but it was September 13th in Japan. The original game is great and holds up well. Challenging, fun secrets, good platforming, a simple game, really. It's an A-tier game for me ahead of Ace Attorney and behind God of War. It's always a good game to pick up. Classic Mario Bros. See where it all started and how it holds up so well in 2024. Next is the Mario Bros Lost Levels, which is just a harder version of the original game with some newer items. It was released on June 3rd of 1986 and only in Japan, and I'm not much of a fan of this one. I'd say this is better if you want a challenge with Mario, but it's a C-tier game to me and it's behind Wizard of Legend. For a 2D Mario game, I want some challenge, but this one just, it's not as fun. Maybe a modern day version of it would be better, but still, C-tier. As you can guess, the next game on this list is Mario Bros 2, the USA version. As a kid, I did not enjoy this game at all. It released in September of 1988 and was basically a reskin of Panic Panic Doki, but this game introduced three more characters to play as with Luigi, Toad, and Peach. And replaying it in 2023, it holds up well, I'd say. A lot of secrets, fun enemies, and unique levels with a few bosses. It's a game I thought I'd hate playing, but it was a good time, and I'd put it at the bottom of B tier for the time being, much better than I remember. Now we have one of the most popular Mario games, and it's one of my favorites for sure, and it's Mario Bros. 3 on the NES. It was released July 15th, 1989 in North America, and it's another fun platform in Mario game that has a lot of fun levels, and it introduces a lot of abilities and even has some fun mini games. I played the remake on Game Boy Advance, but it was still a great time and would easily put this game in A tier ahead of the first Mario Bros. A little fun fact, Mario Bros 3 is the only NES game that I have in its original box. I have some NES games scattered about, you know, put away safely, but I have a challenge set NES that's never been used. It's open, but it's never been used, so I got a nice clean copy of Super Mario Bros 3 waiting for me at any time. There's still a lot more Mario games to go, but I promise you during this time I was still playing other games, they just weren't beat. But the next game I beat was Mario Land 2 Six Golden Coins. It was on the Game Boy Color and released October 21st, 1992, and this game was much better than I expected. Granted, it was a little short, but what Nintendo was able to capture on a Game Boy back in the early 90s is insane. It introduces Wario as the final boss and all the worlds are so unique and unexpected for Nintendo. The platforming is good for what it is and I beat it in a couple hours but loved it. But still, I'd only put it in B tier 
here, but right behind Fire Emblem Engage. It holds up extremely well. Next is yet another Mario game. I was going very hard with being Mario games during March, and this next one was one I hadn't played since my childhood, and it was Yoshi's Island. And I'll say, I forgot how good this game was. You play as Yoshi, and you need to save baby Luigi with baby Mario, and the combat has you throwing eggs with unique platforming. I enjoyed replaying this game a lot, and I would gladly throw it in A tier ahead of the original Mario Bros. And I know, some people will say this is a Yoshi game, but it says Super Mario Land 2 on it, Yoshi's Island. Let's be honest, they put that on there to sell copies. But regardless, it's a great game, and I love it. Guess what's next? That's right, more Mario. The next one we beat was New Super Mario Bros. on the DS. I loved it as a kid, and we'll say replaying it in 2023 shows me it's an average Mario game. The gimmick of it being handheld on the DS with two screens was incredible back in 2006, when it released on May 15th. It was rather short, but still fun. It's Mario platforming, and it's B tier behind Mario Land 2. Now at this point, it's still March, and I'm still beating a bunch of Mario games, but I also officially put down another game, another fantastic game during this time, and it was Dead Cells. Dead Cells released on August 6, 2018, and it's an incredible game. The platforming, Metroidvania aspect, Souls-like combat with enemies, an incredible variety inside of runs, and the crazy amount of DLC. Every Dead Cells run, it feels super fresh, and I absolutely love this game. I got a little burnt out of it once I got to 4 BC, but I played the game for almost 100 hours total, and just like my roguelite tier list, Dead Cells is going in S tier right behind Portal 2. It's one of the best games of all time. But don't you worry, after Dead Cells, we went back to a childhood favorite with New Super Mario Bros. Wii. It released November 15th, 2009, and like New Super Mario Bros. on the DS, the gimmick of it didn't really transfer well in 2023, as this gimmick was being able to play with multiple people on the same screen for the first time, and I played the game alone. Granted, the new abilities and platforming was still good, and I had some fun levels. I'd put it in B tier right ahead of the DS version. And now we have another game that was between the Mario Madness and its Resident Evil, which was released March 23rd, 2023, and this game was amazing. It was my first time playing Resident Evil 4 and my second Resident Evil game ever, and I loved it. The story was so riveting to me, and I was so engrossed the entire time with Leon Kennedy's story, and the evolution of environments throughout the whole story was amazing. I loved everything about this game, from the combat, the inventory management, the lovable characters, just the environment, everything about it was fantastic, and it's one of the best games I've ever played. It's at the top of S tier by a mile. And finally, we have the last game I beat in March, and it's the final Mario game with new Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. This game released January 11th, 2019 on the Switch, as it was a Wii U game, and really, this is the most disappointing 2D Mario game I played. It was so easy and not engaging at all. The platforming was okay, as it's a Mario game, but it's more so a kid's game, and I didn't enjoy it at all. But I'd still put it at the bottom of C tier, but do not want to replay it anytime soon. But maybe I could have also been Mario'd out at this point, as it was about the 11th Mario game I played in the span of a month. And after all that Mario madness ended, I decided to go to a more cozy game, and that one was called Terranil. It released March 28th, 2023, and I'll admit I didn't play too much of it, but did do every level minus one. And it was a good game. It's a reverse city builder where you're trying to save the environment, and I wouldn't stream this game again, but I would play it for sure. It's a nice cozy time, but not too many levels, so it could get tedious fast. But still, a solid B tier game for me, ahead of Mario Bros 2. Now we have another roguelike that got ranked in my latest tier list, and it's Have a Nice Death. It released out of Early Access March 22nd, 2023, and I put it in C tier during my tier list, and played it a little after the fact but still don't really feel too positive with this game. The art style is great, the combat is fun, but I feel the runs are too long and not really rewarding. The difficulty enhancers make the game crazy hard as well, and even on the first run, it's still very hard. Good low of the difficulty, but eh. It's still a C tier game to me, but at the top of C tier. A lot of people probably would love this game, and I think you should try it out at least. C is still pretty average. Next game we beat was fairly successful and got some DLC later in the year that I did end up playing, and it's Dredge. It released March 30th of 2023, and this entire game has you in a fishing boat collecting fish, doing missions for people across different islands, and solving a mystery about some leviathan creatures. Really, I enjoyed this game quite a lot for what it was. You would think the gameplay loop wouldn't be there too much, but I never felt bored in my 20 hour run, and even felt lost a couple times. It's a game I highly suggest as the most tedious thing would be getting all the achievements, and even that only took me a few extra hours after beating the main game. And I will say the DLC for about $3-$5 to $5 is worth it as you get about 2.5 more hours of 
dredge fun. I would put this game right in A tier, but right behind God of War Ragnarok. It was a good time. And now we have the game that haunts me every day from its fan base of, let's say, passionate people, and it's The Binding of Isaac. Everyone assumes I secretly hate this game, but I've only played it for 30 hours, which isn't a lot for how much content there is in the game. But the time I did play, I did thoroughly enjoy it. I want to play it more when I have some time, but it has some of the best item variety and unlocks in any roguelite ever, and has an endless amount of secrets. You need hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands thousands of hours if you want to fully finish this game, and the DLC it has received over the years makes it even better. Plus, multiplayer is in beta right now, which is going to make the game even better. It's an A-tier game ahead of God of War Ragnarok. I promise I'll play more of it eventually. Next is another roguelite played in April, and it doesn't have as much as Isaac, but it's okay fun, and it's Gunsu Guardians. It released in the early access of March 31st, 2023, and it didn't receive any updates for a few months, but the devs seem to be back updating this Horde Survivor. It's a, it's a Horde Survivor. These games are always hit or miss and this one was more hit than miss but it didn't do anything special the runs could get tedious as all the bosses and enemies are the same but it has good potential and i enjoyed my eight hours of it i'd put it in c tier behind mario bros u deluxe to be honest next we have a joke game called pineapple on pizza and this ranking doesn't even make sense to me as this game is 15 minutes long and you just walk around an island doing small tasks and listening to the same music it released march 28th of 2023 and it has an overwhelmingly positive score on steam but it's a joke to me and it goes in d tier for being a joke. It's a free game, so it doesn't matter, but I feel putting it anywhere else would be disrespectful to all the other games. Go try this 15-minute experience and let me know what you think. Next is Loop Hero, and it's another roguelite that I enjoyed a lot. It released March 4th of 2021, and don't let these graphics fool you. Pick your character and have them go around a procedurally generated map in an endless loop around until you die, or retreat back to your base camp. This game can take a while to fully win as it does have a clear story to follow with multiple chapters, but the gameplay is top-notch and so easy to do multiple runs in one city. I put this game in A tier in my last tier list and would still gladly have it in A tier, behind God of War Ragnarok. And now we have the game that I've joked about the most all year and it's Redfall. It released May 2nd of 2023 and this game was just bad. It was hyped up for years and promised a good open world game where you can kill vampires and it just did not deliver. The story was all over the place, the cutscenes were non-existent, the enemies were dumb, and the game was not engaging at all. I did almost everything the game offered in a story and it was not a good time. For some reason, I did all the side quests, all the main missions and everything. This game just sucked. I tried really hard to enjoy it, but I don't know what the hell happened that Arcane Austin. This is a D tier game and it's even behind Pineapple on Pizza. Next is another run at the mill roguelite and it's Wall World. It was released April 5th of 2023. This game is a lot like Dome Keeper, which is one of my favorite roguelites out there, but Wall World lacks in some areas compared to where Dome shine. But that doesn't mean it's a bad game. The runs do end up taking a while and some RNG can make story progression annoying, but the meta progression is really nice and the core gameplay and combat against enemies is really fun. I would say this is a cozy game as well. It was right in the middle of B tier for me in my last tier list video, and it even had some DLC which was a good reason to go back and play some more. And I'd say it's still in B tier. And this next game is where some people may get a little mad at me, but the next game is Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. It was probably a lot of people's game of the year along with Baldur's Gate 3, but take what I say with a grain of salt. Tears of the Kingdom released May 12th of 2023, and it's a lot like Breath of the Wild in terms of gameplay, graphics, but introduced a great new story, side missions, and puzzles, and I never beat it. I only played the game for about six hours before getting a little bored and put the game down, but I was also in the middle of a very very, very long and expensive move going across the country, so maybe that had a little effect on it. But the original Breath of the Wild was a good time, but nothing super memorable for me. So Tears of the Kingdom is going in the DNF, aka did not finish category. And next we have Overwatch 2, which I'll admit, I don't know how to rank a multiplayer game in a list like this, but it released October of 2022, and I played a good amount of it this year at some point, apparently. And I used to be an Overwatch streamer before becoming a variety creator, and nowadays, I don't don't really like Overwatch or view it as that good of a game. But me personally, I don't really like multiplayer shooter games that much anymore, so I'd put Overwatch in C tier. What more do you want to know? You have a bunch of characters you can play for that you probably have to pay for. You have a battle pass. You got toxic people everywhere because it's a ranked game. It's a ranked game. It's a C tier game to me, and that's fine. But next is another FPS game that I played right before I was about to move, and it was Warhammer 4000 Bolt Gun. It released May 23rd of 2023, and I never played a Warhammer game before. 
before. But my move was about May 28th, so I didn't really have a lot of time. But this FPS game gave me the feeling of retro doom. I enjoyed this game, but somehow never actually finished it. Like I said, I was getting ready to move, so that's probably why the reason I never got to actually finish. So sadly, this game is in the did not finish category as well. But from what I played, I enjoyed it a lot. I guess I played a lot more shooter games this year, as you will see, because the next game I beat was Atomic Heart. It was released February 21st, and I was excited for this game because it reminded me a lot of Bioshock based off what I saw. But in the end, it was more disappointing. The combat got tedious, the NPCs were very weird, but the story did pick up towards the second half to bring me back to someone enjoying the game. And with that, I'd put it in C tier right with Overwatch 2. Definitely better than Overwatch 2. I also never got to play the DLC that released in August, as I played this on Game Pass, so I'd have to buy the game and then buy the DLC and all that. Alright, but now we have another roguelite. Seems like I haven't played one of those in a while. And I love this one, and it was Brotato. It released out of early access on June 23rd, 2023, and this is the best Horde Survivor game you can play. I've said that a million times over, and I'll keep saying it. Every run feels truly unique with how many items and classes the base game has, and for a cheap price makes it one of the best pickups. I previously had this game in A tier on my tier list video, but I think I'm gonna move it to S tier ahead of Inscription. I played it a bit more after my last tier list, and really, this is the best of its genre, and I love it. Remember just a game ago we were talking about Atomic Heart reminding me of Bioshock? Well, the next game I ended up beating this year was actually Bioshock, the original. It released August 21st, 2007, and this game was great in 2023. I have played the first two Bioshocks when I was younger, but it was very nice to go back and play through this series this year. Granted, I only played the first one. I'm going to play the other ones this year, I promise. The story was great. The choices you have in the story with the little sisters, the challenge of fighting the big daddies, everything. If you like FPS single player games and you've somehow never played Bioshock, this is one everyone should play, and I'm throwing it in A tier. It's time for another roguelike game that I ranked previously, and this time, it's Darkest Dungeon 2! It released out of early access on May 8th. It's a lot different from the original Darkest Dungeon, as runs don't take 50 hours and more so 4-5 to five hours with a 5 chapter story. The combat in RNG is still brutal, and I'm still a masochist apparently because I loved it. I was able to beat it and even recently picked it back up for the DLC that added 2 new characters to play as and a new boss. That's a lot of fun! I put this game in A tier before, and that's where it's gonna stay. I genuinely just love everything Darkest Dungeon. The combat, the aesthetic, the challenge, the characters, I love it all. All the strategy that goes into the game. It's funny how I said I'm impatient with some games like card games, but then something like Darkest Dungeon, I just get so engrossed in. Darkest Dungeon 2, you were great. Next, another roguelike game, Bleak Sword DX. It was actually the first game I fully started and beat after my move was done. As you could tell, the, the timeline for this little move area was a little bit messy, so keep that in mind, but this is the start of June. They released June 8th, 2023, and it's a hack and slash roguelite with some small Souls-like element. The combat felt good, but some mechanics I felt were poorly implemented, and after a bit felt a little more tedious for me. I had this game in C tier in my tier list video, and that's where it's gonna stay. But I do love the aesthetic, and the beginning of the game was a lot more fun, and even has a coliseum for some replayability. Overall, it's not horrible you should try it. Next is a very popular game that I didn't enjoy as much, mostly due to needing to stop, and it's Street Fighter 6. It released June 1st, and I actually enjoyed this game with my 10 hours in it or so. I didn't even play the single player campaign as I didn't have much interest in it, but what I really enjoyed was the online multiplayer. I've never been good with fighting games as I can never get the combos down to actually land any moves, but Street Fighter 6 actually made this very easy as they had a new control setup with modern controls. Sadly, I had to stop playing as my hands started to feel some pain from mass but I'd still put this game in B tier, very high B tier at that. Now here's another roguelite. I found it a lot of fun, but never played a lot of it, and it's Shogun Showdown. It's a turn-based card game where you travel through different levels and move at the same time as enemies, where you need to time your attacks while dodging theirs. It's a good game with a great setup, and I enjoyed it, but it's one of those games that kind of just slipped off the back of the truck, if you know what I mean. So I have to put this game in the do not finish section. We're still in June at this rate, and in July of 2023, Pikmin 4 was set to be released, so I decided to do a Pikmin marathon, because I love Pikmin. So the next game we played was the original Pikmin, which released October 26, 2001. And for a game made in 2001, it's impressive. But for 2023, it's harder compared to the newer games. The 30-day time limit to scavenge your ship parts made the game a bit harder, and the game lacked a lot of quality of life changes that later entries offer, but for the game as a whole, it's really fun, even if the Pikmin accidentally 
kill themselves a lot. I'd put the original Pikmin in B tier. And then as you can guess, next is Pikmin 2. It was released April 29th, 2004. And this game introduced the cave system, which added a lot more challenge to Pikmin as you go through multiple levels of a cave and then fight a giant boss. It also introduced two new Pikmin variations with white and purple. I love this game, but never got to finish it as my SD card on my GameCube crashed and I did not want to redo six hours of gameplay and beat the entire game in one sitting. So sadly, Pikmin 2 is did not finish. But of course, about two weeks after I played Pikmin 2, Nintendo announced that they were dropping Pikmin 1 and 2 in the eShop, but I never got around to playing those. And as you can guess, next is Pikmin 3 Deluxe, which was actually the first Pikmin game I played back in 2020. It was released onto the Switch on October 30th of 2020, and this Pikmin game is amazing. A lot of quality of life changes with rounding up Pikmin, mass throwing them, auto lock when aiming, and just the controls feeling better as a whole. The game is a little short as I can beat it in about five hours, but it does offer good side missions to keep you engaged, and 100% in the story would take probably 12 hours. This is an A tier game for me as Pikmin is my second favorite Nintendo series, so I always have some soft spots for it. And to your surprise, Pikmin 4 is not the next game that I beat as I beat all the Pikmin games in June, so I had a couple weeks to, you know, get some other games in while I waited for Pikmin 4. And the first game I played was Tape the Tape, which I played on and off until May, but I stopped playing on stream around this time, and it released May 3rd of 2023. And it's an arcade-style hockey roguelike game. It's rather short with a run, but offers some funny items, good characters to have on your team, and it's just a great hockey game for what it is. Fun short runs or arcade games? If you're a hockey fan, you need to try this one. It was a B-tier game in my last video, and it's still a B-tier to me in this one. Next, I started Final Fantasy 16, which released June 22nd, 2023, and this was my first time fully diving into a Final Fantasy game, and I enjoyed it. The combat was great, the storytelling was engaging, and the cutscenes were incredibly well done. Some boss fights were a little long, and I technically didn't finish the game, but I did play it for about 35 hours, and I was almost done. I got like 18 chapters left, but just had to stop playing it as it wasn't really a good stream game. So sadly, I did not finish it, but out of all the games I didn't finish, this is the one I've played the most. So it's going in the did not finish category, but I'm gonna pick it back up at some point this year and finish it off. Next is another game I view as a joke, but it took over Twitch and it's only up. You can't even buy this game anymore, but I did beat it in June. This game is what the name says. You go up and up with some not so good platforming. The game was made to make you mad and it's not really a good game. It felt good to beat, but I wouldn't want to do it again. I'd throw this game in D tier, but hey, it's still ahead of Redfall. After a disastrous game like Only Up, why don't we transition to one of my favorite games of the year with Dave the Diver. It was released June 28th and this game allows you to dive underwater, catch fish, meet sea people, and then help run a sushi shop at night. I didn't know what to expect going into this game, but I ended up loving it. This game keeps introducing new mechanics 25 hours into the game and it has so much love put into it. I feel anyone can enjoy this. The coziness of diving in the water, seeing all the fishes and items you can get, and then the hectic dinner rush that has you serving food to everyone. You can hire staff, farm, and then even play mini games on your phone. Dave the Diver has it all and was a very memorable experience, and it goes right in the S tier. Of course, I played a lot of single player games like Dave the Diver this year, but another type of game I played a lot this year was Horde Survivors. And this next one is probably the silliest game I played, and it was Choo Choo Survivors. It was released June 26, 2023, and this game has you play as a train collecting weapons and survivors while killing a bunch of zombies. The game was okay. I enjoyed the silliness of it and didn't take it too seriously as the gameplay was like all other Horde survivors. It has a few maps, but I didn't really notice much of a difference between the maps besides a few enemies. The variety in trains is also nice, and the achievements, there's a lot of them. But really, I'd throw this game right in C tier. Now we have one of the biggest meme games on my Twitch channel since I played it for 70 hours to kill 100,000 dinosaurs, and it's Exo Prime. It was released July 14th, and people think I hate this game, but honestly, the gameplay is pretty great. The story drags on and gets a little boring, but the graphics look fantastic, and killing dinosaurs with a little PvP towards the end of a match, it's honestly good fun. Towards the end of my 100,000 kill journey, I was getting a little sick of it, but as a whole, the gameplay is great, with a good variety of fighters to choose from. I'd throw this game in the bottom of B tier, really. It stinks that it isn't free to play, as that would make the game much more desirable to play for most people. Next, we have another roguelike that I was genuinely excited for, but I felt a little bit disappointed after it, and it's Mega City Police. It released July 28th, 2023, and this was a game I got early to make content on, and I beat it before it even officially released. The runs are incredibly short at about 15 minutes if you win, but the game is way too hard and does not drop enough healing items. The game has multiple different characters with different abilities, but most of them don't feel that good to use, and normal difficulty feels the same as the hardest one. It's a game that's okay, but nothing super special. And with that, it goes in C tier, but above Choo Choo Survivors. Remember that Pikmin marathon we did back in June? 
Well, it finally came to an end when I finally got the beat Pikmin 4, which released July 21st, 2023. This Pikmin game was long, but amazing. The story of this Pikmin game brings back the cave systems from the second iteration and introduces a new mini game called Dandori Battles, where you have a time limit to collect items or face a CPU in battle. You can fight a friend in Dandori Battles, but I never really did that. This game has everything. After beating the main story, you're allowed to play Olimar's story, which is the entire Pikmin 1 story condensed into a six hour session. Pikmin 4 is a combination of every game in the series with story, modes, and Pikmin available, and I loved this game. One of my favorites of the year by a mile, and by far my favorite Pikmin game. It's an easy S tier game to me. Now we have an early access Horde Survivor, but it's actually very good, and it's Halls of Torment. It was released May 24th, and this Horde Survivor reminded me a bit of classic Diablo with the graphics, but has good meta progression, a good amount of characters to unlock, and even a lot of equipable items to add buffs for a run. Inside a run, it's your typical Horde Survivor of killing enemies, leveling up, and getting weapons. The progression felt good, and every level had unique enemies and bosses to fight, and they were actually quite hard to win on. It's one game I'm 100% keeping my eye on, and I'm excited to see what else it adds once it gets into 1.0. It's an A tier game for me. Next, we have a Mega Man-esque roguelite that I did not play enough of, but it's 30XX. It was released August 9th, and this game has you go through multiple levels in a run where you choose which level you want, and the level will get harder depending on how far you're into the run. I only played the game for about 7 hours and never actually got to finish a run, just sort of one of those games that I forgot to continue. It's a very good game with fun platforming, great item variety for a lot of good variety in the runs, and can even be played in co-op. If you're a fan of Mega Man games, you need to try this one out, but sadly, it goes in the did not finish category category for me. And next we have Super Mario World, which I played a lot during the Mario Marathon in like May, but in the summer I played a lot of Kaizo Mario levels, which are community made ROM hacks that are incredibly hard. I only did those hacks for a month or so, but Mario World as a whole is my favorite Mario game ever. The graphics, the platforming, and secrets, I love this game. It's an S tier game as always, and you knew this was coming. Now this next game is the first game that I actually let my Twitch chat decide, and it was based off something new that we were doing. If you don't know, I sometimes play marbles on stream with my community and do a Grand Prix of four races. And the winner of that Grand Prix gets to pick what game I stream. And the first time I did this, the first game that won was Fallout 4. And that game was initially released November 9th, 2015. And a lot of people seem to view this as a bad Fallout game, but I genuinely enjoyed this game a lot. I joined every faction and tried to do as many side missions as possible. The story was fun and engaging, and I loved recruiting new people to join my journey into the wasteland. I honestly enjoyed this one more than Fallout New Vegas, so it's going in A tier. I did a throwback game next, or more so a game that reminded me of a throwback with Whisker Squadron Survivor. This game released in the early access on August 21st, 2023, and it didn't have a lot of content on release, minus two maps. But this game reminded me a lot of Star Fox 64, which I loved. So I did enjoy this one, just didn't have enough content for me. I'll revisit it one day when I have time, and once it's in 1.0 most likely. But on release date, I'd say this is a C tier game with a lot of potential to go even higher. Next is a game that I feel like a lot of people missed, but I did enjoy my time with it quite a bit and it was Immortals of Avium. It was released August 31st, 2023, and this is an FPS magic game that doesn't even have any guns. You have a lot of different magic that can be buffed with a skill tree, and overall, throughout the game, the combat stayed pretty good. The story wasn't too bad, but it was rather short and not much reason to replay it. I'd have a hard time suggesting this game at its full price, but I enjoyed it and would throw it in the B tier. A Metroidvania is next, and it's one of my favorite Metroidvanias ever after playing it, and it's Blasphemous 2. It was released August 24th, which was the same day as Armored Core 6, so I had to choose which one to play, and I'm glad I chose Blasphemous. This story was so well paced, and the balance felt incredible with every weapon feeling so useful. I loved playing through this game, despite never playing the first, but I will say some bosses were a little easier than I expected with this game being advertised as a Souls-like. I expected some more suffering, but I'm not complaining. The incredible pixel graphics with fantastic upgrades, fantastic fantastic combat, fun puzzles that aren't too challenging, really just a great game and one of my favorites of the year. Minus some of the graphics being a little disturbing. I'd put it right at the top of A tier really. Next is another Metroidvania that is somewhat of a classic and it's Dust and Elysian Tale. This was another Marbles on stream game and it was initially released in August of 2012. You play as Dust and find yourself in a forest with a sword named Ara and a creature called a Nimbat. Initially, I thought this game wasn't too bad. The combat felt fun and the game had a good amount of side quests, but I will say I avoided some 
side quest after the first few chapters as when i played this game starfield was about to come out so i had to rush this one a little bit that made the final mission absolutely horrible it was so tedious fighting all these enemies with a lack of checkpoints to make it absolutely barbaric going through it on top of that the final boss was so much longer than it needed to be like four phases or something like that i'll say i enjoyed the story but that final chapter really ruined it for me but i'd still put this game in c tier for an xbox live arcade game it could be a lot worse while i continued waiting for starfield i was playing another game called soulstone survivors on my let's play channel on youtube and it's one of those roguelike games that just never ends as it's a horde survivor it released in the early access november 7th of 2022 and you just kill enemies you level up and you win but this one is a little more unique to me it has a lot of characters to unlock a crazy amount of buffs in a skill tree crazy amounts of difficulty enhancers and a lot of characters all with different upgrades as well this game will have you play it a lot to 100 it but i really enjoy how quick the runs can be as a win and run can take you 10 minutes and then you just continue on a new map or just go back to the main menu this is probably one of the top five horde survivors you can play i'd throw it in low a tier it has a lot of potential after that i did start starfield but the next game that i beat <laughs> i beat it in the middle of my starfield campaign and it was Gunbrella. It released September 13th, and this is a side-scroller platform game with some Metroidvania aspects. In this game, I felt fell under a lot of people's radars. The controls are a little funky at first, with combat and movement happening at the same time, and the game's difficulty doesn't really feel any different between easy and hard. But overall, I liked it. It just didn't wow me too much. I got all the achievements in about 15 hours, and one playthrough would probably take you 6 to 8 hours, I'd guess. It wasn't anything too special, but I'd throw this game right in B tier. Next is finally Starfield, as I beat the game after a beefy 70 hour playthrough. It was released September 5th and it was one of my most anticipated games of the year. I know a lot of people did not like this game or they wanted it to fail, but personally I enjoyed my time with it. I loved exploring through all the different solar systems and scouting an entire planet, joining and finishing every faction, and doing as many side quests as possible. I did a lot with this game, but towards the end of it, I felt fulfilled. It has negatives with a lot of loading screens, some jank here and there, and mainly I felt New Game Plus was not fun or worth it but i did enjoy the game it's not a perfect game but i'd still throw it in a tier and play it again in the future also the gunplay felt fantastic next we had another marbles on stream grand prix happen so a twitch chat member decided on this game and it's a game i actually wanted to play when it initially released but it was Remnant 2. It released July 25th, and this is a third-person shooter Souls-like game. You can play co-op or solo as you travel through multiple worlds fighting lots of different enemies. And like most Souls-like games, I didn't know the story too well, but I loved the combat and the gunplay. I didn't get much replayability after my initial playthrough due to time constraints, but I would love to play through this game again and explore all the worlds and fight all the bosses. As the satisfaction of winning a boss fight in a Souls-like game, it always gives you a good feeling of euphoria. Remnant 2 is an A-tier game to me, but more so the bottom of A tier. I was on a time constraint with Remnant 2 because the next game I was really excited for was getting a 2.0 update plus a big DLC and it was Cyberpunk 2077. It initially released December 9th of 2020, and we don't need to talk about that release, but the Phantom Liberty DLC released September 25th of 2023, and along with the Phantom Liberty DLC, they had a 2.0 update, which changed so much with skill tree upgrades, weapons, and overall quality of life in the game. It skyrocketed, and I loved it. I think this game is amazing, and the Phantom Liberty DLC was top level. I loved doing almost every side mission in my last playthrough, getting every collectible I could, and discovering and the new characters in the DLC. I played for about 60 hours and loved every minute of it. I honestly think Cyberpunk is an S tier game with this new DLC and update, so it's an S tier. Next, we have a roguelite that is, well, a pretty okay game. I'll admit, I lost some patience with it, and I should probably go back and play it more, but it's Axolotl. It's a top-down shooter where you play as an Axolotl with a gun. Travel through five worlds, collecting ingredients to craft class buffs and collect baby Axolotls to use in runs, and currencies to buy weapons and items to find in the run. I never beat a run fully, but I got close a few times, and I can still feel I can properly rank this game. Most items feel worthless and not really worth taking. Same with a lot of weapons, as enemies are sponges in the game, later on. The meta progression is quite slow, and I didn't feel much reason to give many axolotls any abilities after finding the best one. I'd throw it right in C tier as I think it has a lot of potential with some quality of life changes, but from my last time playing, it's a C tier game for me. Next I picked up a roguelite that reminded me of Hades when I saw it, and it's Night vs. Giant The Broken Excalibur. This game has you go through three worlds with two levels each, and each world has a main boss in the second level and a mini boss on the first. And at first, I thought this game was really fun. The combat did remind me 
of Hades, the meta progression was quite well, but kind of insignificant, and I did struggle for a little bit, but the downsides were how long it took to unlock new varieties of weapons for me, and the run started to feel a little stale. After a few hours, I realized nothing really changes in a run, nor did the game have any difficulty enhancers. I did complete the game fully and got all the achievements, but towards the end of it, I was really done and not really satisfied. I'd put it in C tier and more so at the bottom of it. It started strong, but it fell face first in the dirt. Next, we have another roguelite that's made some appearances on this YouTube channel, and it's Wizard with a Gun. You travel back in time with each run trying to stop Arcane, the main enemy, from destroying the world. The game has multiple biomes as you progress the story and a lot of materials for you to craft with. Outside of runs, you have your own little hub world that you make. You find recipes to craft inside of a run and build tons of different equipment that all relate to different effects. Some equipment's more poisonous and some are better with freezing enemies. The game shines with its variety and builds within the five weapons it has since it has tons of different bullets to craft. The runs didn't last too long and the inventory management was a mess when I played it and it made crafting super tedious. And I almost quit the game a couple times, but looking back, I did thoroughly enjoy my time with Wizard with a Gun and it has some incredible art style as well. I'd put this game a little above average right in the B category. Category. Next is the latest meme that has spawned in my Twitch community based off people loving it or hating it, and it's Dong and Rampa Trigger Happy Havoc. It's another game that was requested courtesy of Marbles on Stream. This is a visual novel game where you're trapped in a high school with 15 students forced to murder each other. The story of this game is genuinely really good, and the direction of the class trials, which is the best part of the game, is also really good. It does require you to talk a lot if you stream it when during free time or investigations, but minus that, the story really carries this game. It has lovable characters, memorable trials, and some decent mini games inside those trials. It was long, but I genuinely did enjoy it and would easily say this is an A tier game. After Dong and Rampa, we took a little break from Marbles because right as I finished that game, Super Mario Bros. Wonder fully released, and I had to jump into that game. I did a 2D Mario marathon. Of course I was playing this. A lot of people said this was the best 2D Mario game in 20 plus years, and well, I agree with that as the competition isn't that high, but it was one of those games for me that was a one and done. The art style was stunning and I really liked the direction Nintendo went with it and some new power-ups were nice. And the ability to play as multiple characters but none of them really changed anything, I guess that was okay. The game as a whole was good and I enjoyed the platforming and I beat the game in about 7 hours. And I really didn't feel the need to do any more. I like 2D Mario and I play them all but this was a high B tier for me. Next is a game I fully beat off stream because I got an early copy for it and had an embargo on it, but it was Robocop Rogue City. This game pays very good homage to the Robocop franchise as it's filled with non-stop action. The game is a little short, but the gunplay is very smooth and you're an indestructible robot. Of course, you can still die, but I never really did as the game was a little easy. The small open world sections you do have were kind of barren and boring, which brought the game down for me, but another negative was how slow Robocop as a character was, but that isn't that big of a deal. You're a goddamn robot, of course you're gonna be a little slow. The combat is what carried this game and the action felt really good. I also may have said it was short, but it didn't overstay its welcome, which I can appreciate. I'm saying it's a solid B tier and a really great pickup if you're a Robocop fan. Next, we have a game that I played for Halloween and it's Resident Evil 2. I was looking for any excuse to play more Resident Evil, so I was excited for this one. This is the first Resident Evil game where you can play as Leon Kennedy, so I was excited for that. But the story as a whole was well paced. You have two different stories to play as with Leon and Claire, and while they are similar in location, locations, the story events that happen in them, along with the variety and weapons to keep both of them fresh, helped keep me engaged with the entire game. I did both stories to get the true ending and loved every minute of it. I'm not sure whether to put this in S or A tier, so I'll throw it in at the top of A tier. Next, we have Exit the Gungeon. I was very excited for this game because of my love for Enter the Gungeon, but I did hear a lot of negatives about this. But for me, it felt pretty great. It's an action platform game that was released first on Apple Arcade. Exit the Gungeon is very fast paced and it can be hard to keep track of your character if all the bullets flying on the screen, and I will say this game does feel a little bit harder than Enter the Gungeon, but it doesn't have that same replayability or same variety that got me hooked in the original. I did clear the game with every character and did love the core gameplay as it gives me that Gungeon feel, and the great amount of little mini games they have inside of a run was really fun. But I'd say this game is only a high B tier game compared to Enter the Gungeon, 
be in an easy S tier, but still, a game you should pick up. At this point in time, we're in November, and next we have another Marvels on stream game, and it was Marvel Spider-Man Remastered. I am the one that actually won this Marvels, because I also join in on those races, and with that, I picked this game. I was playing it in anticipation for the second Spider-Man game, which I still haven't played, but the original was a lot of fun. I quickly got addicted to collecting everything, and didn't even really use the fast travel until the end game with collecting. I collected everything I could in the main story, with all the Taskmaster challenges, backpacks, side quests in the lab, every collectible imaginable, minus the DLC. I still have yet to play those, but overall, the game was great. The combat was a lot of fun, collecting all the suits and suit upgrades to keep combat interesting was great, and the difficulty of enemies improved at a steady rate as the game progressed. There are some things I didn't enjoy like the MJ and Miles missions, and sometimes I felt it was a button mashing sim, but overall, a great game that is easily going into A tier. Hopefully, I can play Spider-Man 2 this year. Next, we have one of my top roguelites of the year with RoboQuest. You bounty your way through four chapters, going through multiple rooms and gathering golden wrenches in the run for meta progression and power cells for in-run upgrades, and new weapons and items that give you buffs. The game honestly reminds me of a fast-paced of roguelite Doom with Borderlands-style graphics, and it plays very well. I was only ever able to clear the game once, but I did unlock all the characters, almost filled out the meta progression, and started to unlock the difficulty enhancers, but still missed a lot of the secrets. This game has a lot, and I think it's one of the best FPS roguelites that you can play. It's definitely one of the best I've played, and you can play it with a friend if you want want to. It's an A-tier game and I hope to play more of it soon. And I talked about Doom for a hot second there with RoboQuest, but the next game I actually ended up playing was Doom 2016. It was yet another Marvels game, but the first Doom game I played since Xbox 360. In Doom, you play through 13 chapters, with each chapter having a good handful of secrets and a whole lot of fighting. We can admit that Doom is known for its combat and blood and gore and crazy kill animations and all that. And this game delivered. I played on Nightmare Difficulty, which did give me a good challenge, especially towards the end of the game with some of those combat rooms, but every room had me utilizing the upgrades they would give, weapons, and ammo. It was a breath of fresh air to play such a fast-paced shooter game that didn't have any multiplayer. Kind of like a more violent RoboQuest, with more focus on story. It was a great time and it makes me want to play Doom Eternal. Hopefully I'll get to in 2024. This is an A-tier game, even if it was a little short. Next was another Marbles game. I give Twitch chat way too much power, but it was Pajama Sam No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside. Yeah. This is a point and click game that was released in the 90s. You need to go through and collect items for Sam to defeat darkness. It's a kid's game and you beat it in like 90 minutes. I never played this growing up so I didn't have any nostalgia towards it, but looking at it, I know as a kid, I would have loved it. But as an adult, I'll just say, okay. Some items were a little hard to spot here and there if I didn't have my glasses on because I'm old, but it wasn't really challenging. It was an average game in the C tier. Maybe you loved it during your childhood, but it was a funny little game to play, that's for sure. And now we have a game I made a video on recently so I won't dive too deep into it, but it's Astral Ascent. It's an action platform roguelite that has you play as one of four characters battling your way through five worlds, with each world ending in a boss fight against the Zodiac sign. I love this game. I got the true ending for each character, which requires you to beat the game on Destiny level 6 with every character. But the amount of variety and builds with all the spells is incredible. Every character has their own unique spells you get in a run, and you can even apply gambits to them, which are buffs. The spell variety is great, a lot of meta progression, and a lot of difficulty enhancers to really make these runs insane. This is one of the best roguelites of the year, and I think more people need to play it. It's at the top of A tier. Next, we have an early access game that I'd say I didn't fully beat, but I explored all the content I wanted to until more is added, and it's Death Must Die. It's a horde survivor that has you survive 20 minutes, and once you kill Dracula, you win. I imagine once the game is released into 1.0, runs will be 25 to 30 minutes, but last I played, it had five characters, all with starting buffs, and every character could hold items like a Souls-like game with equipment items, for extra buffs. It has some difficulty enhancers as well, but I never really explored those. I beat the game about three times and felt fulfilled with that. I'm waiting for more content to drop, so keep that in mind with this ranking, but I'm saying it's a C tier game for me. I just didn't feel super engrossed with it but it can easily move up with more content. The next game I played was another Marbles game that I knew it was gonna come eventually, I was just hoping in 2024, and it's Dong and Rampa 2 Goodbye Despair, my Twitch chat's favorite meme. It was like the first one, a bunch of high school students forced to kill each other, except this time on an island. The twists and turns of the chapters in this game I felt were good, but the filler between class trials for me was very long. I could easily skip the free time that you get to bond with other students, but I didn't really wanna do that. It took me about 40 hours to 
beat, and I didn't hate it like people think I do. It was just really tiring. If you like visual novel games, I highly suggest Danganronpa. It is good, but I do think the first one was better. The second game is still an A-tier game. Next is another Marbles on Stream game. If you can tell, I do a lot of Marbles on Stream, but this next game was Roller Drum. It's a fast-paced roller skate and shooter game, and it was released August 16th of 2022. Genuinely, I thought this game was great. It was just a little short as the game only has four main missions and your job is to complete enough tasks for you to move on into the roller drone competition. The game starts off pretty easy but gets insane as you need to balance your ammo and constantly keep track of what gun you want to use to kill enemies. You regain ammo by doing tricks so you need to constantly dodge bullets while performing some sick tricks on these roller skates. This game reminded me a lot of Tony Hawk but on a whole new level. I wish the game was a tad longer to stretch out the difficulty pace in a bit as it does get quite hard quite fast but overall it was good. The price for it can be hard to justify as one playthrough can take like five to six hours, but if you're a completionist, you will be playing this a lot more. I'd say this is a solid B tier game. Next, I did my yearly playthrough on one of my favorite games of all time, and it's Paper Mario on the Nintendo 64. It was released August 11, 2000, and this is the first Paper Mario game where you travel through seven different kingdoms, saving star spirits to save Princess Peach from Bowser. I love this game, which is why I play it every single year. The graphics are top tier, the turn-based combat I feel is so easy and fun. All the partners that Mario has, they're kind of basic, but I love them all. I'll say this game does have some bias and nostalgia tied to it, but there's a reason I play it every year, like I said. It's an S tier game to me, and always will be. Next, we have another roguelike game that I dived into since it got a huge update, and I did make a video on it, so we won't talk about it too much, but it's Tiny Rogues. This roguelite is great, and I highly suggest everyone play it. After this update, the game has 35 different characters to play as, all of them which you have to unlock, which they're all pretty easy to unlock, and has hundreds of pieces of equipment and weapons to make every run feel super fresh. The amount of text on the screen can be a turnoff for some people, but the combat is incredible and simplistic. You can be on the final floor of a run with difficulty enhancers on and still get an utterly chaotic run. I love this game and I'm excited for all the updates that it has planned. It's still in early access for now, so I'm going to say it's only an A tier game to me, but I can easily see this game be an S tier by the time it's in 1.0. Finally, we have the last game that I beat in 2023 and it's another Marbles on stream game. I play way too many of these things, but it was Resident Evil 3, the remake of course. You play as Jill trying to escape Raccoon City from a zombie apocalypse caused by the Umbrella Corporation. This game is as fun as every other Resident Evil I played. The item collecting, combat, and storytelling was all similar to the second game's remake and was just as fun. I will say I'm a bit sad with how much shorter this game is compared to the second because it only has one playthrough, but it's still a great time. The puzzles were not too complicated, and it was very fun and easy collecting every item in the game. I would 100% play this game again, and I'd stick it right in A tier behind the second game's remake. And that's every game that I've beaten or played a decent amount of in 2023 played enough to justify putting it in here. I thought this project of a tier list would be kind of fun and I wanted it to be in the beginning of the year, but a video like this takes a very long time, but it was fun going back on the year and seeing all the great games that I got to play, and it makes me look forward to 2024 even more. Thanks for watching as always, and if you want to watch my playthrough of any of the games I mentioned, you can go watch on my YouTube Let's Play channel. I try to upload absolutely everything on there, but I might have missed a few games here and there, but if you want to go watch me play those games, you can right there. And yeah. That's all. Thanks for watching.